welcome to the Influence of Social Media. I'm Brittany Richter, head of social for iProspect in the US. Jordan Jacobson, regional director of social for the West. And we're here today to talk specifically about the influence of social media because we're seeing that every year the social budgets are exploding and not just by taking on new clients, but within our existing clients, the spends are getting larger every year because we're seeing so much value in what we're doing. But we've realized now that there are so many pieces of social media, not just paid social, but other elements of social that really all need to be working together and working in lockstep in order to fully unlock all of the influence that's out there. So that's what we're gonna focus on today. And we know that the size the scale of the social platforms is absolutely massive. And we have so much opportunity as it relates to inventory. But one of the questions that we always get is, for brands who first started advertising on Facebook and Instagram, since that's initially where the only ads were available, they're wanting to expand, so they're asking us where their next dollar should be spent. And there's no one magic answer. It depends on who your target audience is and what objectives you're trying to drive. But there's a ton of opportunity, as you can see by even just the sheer size of the scale across all of the major social platforms. The other question that we get a lot is, are the kids really still on Facebook? And the answer to that question is yes. Um, the research shows that they may not talk about being on Facebook the same way that they used to, but they're still there, and they still feel like they need to be connected, so there's still an opportunity to reach them. Then when we think about those perhaps with more decisioning power and more purchase power specifically, we know that they're on Facebook as well, but they're also on the other social platforms and there's opportunity elsewhere. Um, just one example of the size of that audience on Snap. So we know that there's a, a lot um, that we can unlock across all of these platforms. When we're thinking about the consumer and their behavior, 92% of people trust recommendations from people that they know. 72% of consumers trust online recommendations as much as they trust offline, and 71% of consumers say that something that they saw on social media influenced a purchase decision that they made. So it's very clear that all of the activity happening on these platforms and in this space is really influencing the buying decisions that are happening. But it's not necessarily easy. So there is so much change, and we always talk about the pace of change in digital and in media in general being so fast and so much to keep up with, and in social that, that this is particularly true. So we can see by these numbers just how many changes are happening even in the course of a single year and all of the areas where they are. Some of these we're used to. We're used to having more than six platforms. We're used to having hundreds of vendors to potentially talk to and over 175 different creative units available to us. But some of them are new and becoming increasingly increasingly um, more complicated. The intro of science and legal into things that we're doing within social, whether it's learning Boolean logic, which powers social listening, or keeping up with FTC compliance so that we can get, engage in influencer marketing, there's a lot to keep up with. And we are, and we're on top of it, and we're figuring out what this means for brands and how it translates to value. But with all this change means evolution of where social media is providing value, and we're seeing that if there are brands or clients who aren't leveraging everything that's available across social media, there's a lot of time and money being wasted on tactics or activities that no longer have the same value that they used to and other opportunities still being left on the table. And there's four main areas where we feel like this is where we're seeing this opportunity either on the table or the wrong effort over impact and balance. And we're seeing that many of our clients are leaning in. And as we said, the budgets are, in, are exploding. So obviously there's a lot of interest and everyone's leaning into social, but not really across all four of these simultaneously, which again, all four of them working together is how we know that we'll unlock the true influence of social media for your business objectives. Me and Brittany could talk about the influence of social media all night. We have a limited amount of time, so we really wanted to focus on where we think the biggest opportunity is. And that really comes to looking at your social ecosystem holistically and figuring out where you can optimize across it to find efficiency. We know there's media spin, there's creative production budget, there's technology, um, there's resources internally, but how do we look at that all together and figure out where we can maximize our impact? And probably you know, the first place to look it's gonna be on the paid side where the majority of the investment is. And I promise I did not pay Katie from Facebook to tee this up earlier. We're talking about mid-funnel. In fact, I told Brittany I didn't wanna say the F word. I didn't wanna talk about funnels at all. <laughs> I told that joke six times now, so thanks for laughing. Um, but really, this is something that our clients are bringing up to us. Steve from Wolverine is around here somewhere in the past session. We just had this conversation on the shuttle on Monday. But it really is looking about how our clients are organized. We have the brand side of the house, and these clients are 
buying on reach and frequency, we're buying for video views, we're optimizing even towards TRPs and augmenting uh, the above line strategies and your television strategies. And then we have our e-com and performance clients that are really doubling down and maxing out remarketing, looking to optimize for ROI, ROAS, <coughs> lead, CPA, and no one's claiming the middle. Because as we add mid-funnel audiences that we know are valuable to our brands and our clients, we start seeing if we add these audiences to our brand campaigns, we start seeing deficiency increase on our KPIs there. If we add them to our performance campaigns, we start seeing those ROAS and ROI numbers start to slip. But there, we can all align that you know, app and content engagers that lookalikes that in-market shoppers for our category are all relevant audiences for us, but we need to align with stakeholders um, and really set expectations of what KPIs we're going to be optimizing towards. And the clients that we really see winning in this mid-funnel area are doing exactly that. And this mid-funnel concept is not just a paid social issue or a social issue. This is really a complex problem that affects all the marketing and all the media. We just think that paid social is a great opportunity to start developing those KPIs, start testing into these strategies, and you can start seeing of how that can live and breathe within the social ecosystem. Some of these audiences are very unique to paid social, such as Pinterest search, which you aren't going to find that rich data of consumer engagement anywhere else, uh, to Snapchat consumption of video content on that platform. But there's also such things as account-based marketing on LinkedIn, where we can actually do B2B in the mid-funnel, um, all the way down to like third-party data sources to start activating some of those or some of those audiences. And why we think paid social is so prime to start testing the mid-funnel and start proving the value of there. Uh, of these strategies is first and foremost due to data integration. You have first, second, and third party data. Obviously your first party data that's coming from your own CRM or your website or your own app. There's second party data, which the social platforms have more than anybody else. That actually content engagement, that what they know about you from a behavioral standpoint. And third party data as it integrates and in, even from uh, the M1 conversations that we had uh, yesterday's uh, main stage sessions, M1 connects to every single one of the social platforms. Next is scale. As Brittany said, the scale of these platforms are massive. And the importance of that is that we don't need to test this with a media plan that has 35 partners on it and is incredibly complex and we have a million different assets. We can really use one or two to start proving the value of this and start sharing those learnings with other channels. And with that scale comes cost efficiency. If you look at the CPM or just rates from Facebook, Instagram, Snap, any of the social platforms and compare them against any other digital platform, they're on par, if not better. Between the scale and the auction-based environment, where you have amazing iProspect paid social employees behind the scenes optimizing those levers to make it efficient, um, you really get to be able to test this with a very low barrier to entry. And lastly is creative flexibility. Katie from Facebook showed two mid-funnel creative units that are launching right now, but it's not just Facebook. If you look at Snap and what you can do from uh, an audience lens or a world lens on that platform or what you can do on Pinterest from an autoplay video perspective, you can start developing specific creative units with specific call to actions directly for those mid-funnel audiences that get them to take the, uh, the next action that you're looking for them to take and start building those remarketing lists and really filling that funnel. The next area of opportunity is in organic social. And those of you who know me well are probably wondering why the heck I'm talking about organic social when for the past four years I've been up, up here talking about how it's a pay-to-play space. And it is a pay-to-play space, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a role for organic. It's just that the value that it provides is different and the things that we should be doing in that area are evolving. So the first thing I have is a question. How many of you used to have, or maybe still have, I don't know, judgment, a blog spot or a Zanga or one of those old school blogs? Anyone? Yeah, it was good. all right. So I had one. Um, not gonna tell you what my handle was. No one needs to go back and dig that up. Um, but the reason why I'm asking about that is because the consumer behavior used to be where you had a blog and almost everyone had a section called something like link love. And you would send links back to other blogs or websites that you liked. And that's one of the things that the search engines use to rank content organically in the SERP. So, now my SEO is showing because I was an SEO nerd before I was a social nerd, but it, they're external follow links. And external follow links are still important, but there's new metrics. 
This is a screenshot of the 2017 search metrics report. The green box is around social signals. Because consumer behavior now is about sharing relevant content and quality content on social, the search engines are adapting. And in addition to those external follow links, are also looking at social signals. So anytime a link to your website is shared on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and yes, a couple people I think still use Google+, that is sending a a social signal back to the engines that this is relevant and quality content, and that's being used in terms of SEO rankings. The other thing that we can do within SEO is think about additional SERP real estate. If you have longer tailed keywords that you aren't able to create that long form site content for that you would need in order for your own .com to rank for those keywords, you can actually leverage some of organic social to rank. So you can use a pin, a tweet, or even boards on Pinterest, and you can optimize them for those longer tailed keywords, and they have potential to rank within the SERP themselves. So we have to be sure that we're thinking about organic search whenever we're thinking about organic social and what we're doing in that space. The other side of this is social search. So consumers are no longer searching only within search engines. They're also searching within the social platforms. In particular, YouTube was mentioned yesterday, but also Twitter and Pinterest. There's a lot of activity happening there. And just like we would optimize your site to show up in the search engine searches, we can do the same thing within organic social to show up for consumers who are searching here. Whether it's using the keywords, having the right hashtag strategy in place, there's a lot that we can do to generate additional organic referral traffic, both from SEO and from organic social if we're thinking about these two things in an integrated way. Outside of social SEO, there's a couple of other areas where we're seeing value in organic social. First, it's social customer service. Janine mentioned this yesterday in her panel, and this has been a thing since brands started signing up for Twitter and consumers started complaining to brands on Twitter, and everyone realized that they needed to be listening to what people were saying to them about them, about their products, about their services, and about their stakeholders. It's incredibly important to be aware of that conversation and participating rather than just passively observing it and not helping to drive and address that conversation. Now, the stakes are even higher. With things like Messenger that we talked about this morning, the consumer expectation is that they have the ability to speak to brands through this medium, so you have to make sure that you have these things in place. The other thing in the other side of social listening is what we call social intelligence. And it's the idea of using social listening software and queries and that Boolean logic I mentioned earlier to find out about your target audience. What's important to them and how can we use that to inform targeting strategies, creative strategies? Can we use this to identify new points of interest and new audiences that maybe we weren't considering before? What are your competitors doing? What are they talking about? What are people saying about your competitors? There's also opportunity to learn about feedback about your products and services, and that could potentially change the way you merchandise in store, merchandise on site, or even develop or create new or additional products or services. The other side of this is as measurement. Anytime you're doing a large branding campaign, no matter which channels or media outlets are powering that campaign, you can and should be using social listening to monitor things like social share of voice and sentiment and get direct product feedback from the consumer. Lastly, influencer marketing. With the algorithms changing in the ways that they are, we're seeing that influencer and user-generated content is more important than ever. But as Jordan has mentioned, it needs to be held accountable, just like all other media. We can't just simply hope that it's working. We need to look at it through a performance lens. In influencer marketing in particular, when we talk about optimizing the entire social ecosystem, is a great starting point because it really is kind of the center of that Venn diagram of paid social and organic social. It's a paid for space, but it has so many legs into the organic space. But the influencer space has been a bit of the wild west, um, and there's been a lot of publication about what's going on within the space, and all the press is not necessarily good press. You can see that there's a lot of conversation about this. And I'd say even the majority of it has been relatively negative. But there's been major developments specifically this year already that are making the influencer space more accountable. These are the four things really highlighted here on the left. The first is talent identification. There's more and more technology that's available to make sure that we can identify the right talent, and that their audience is actually meets our clients customer base and that their followers are real, that they aren't bots, that they aren't fake, that they don't all live in the Philippines or somewhere where you can buy a fan for you know, pennies on the dollar, uh, but they're actually the right audience with the right uh, consumer makeup. Third is the cost of value, which is really measurement. When I first ran influencer campaigns, you really looked at them of like what their followers were, you would estimate a reach, provide some sort of proxy value and try to come up with some fluffy number that said that it was accountable, but we are really 
developing a lot in the tagging, tracking, and uh, measurement space within Influencer that we think will uh, prove to be a long-term success. And lastly is asset ownership, which might be the most important thing that we see as an immediate miss to any of our clients that are running Influencer campaigns currently, is to make sure that when you uh, influencer partnerships happen, that the brand owns the asset so they can be maximized beyond just the influencer investment, but they can be leveraged in email, they can be leveraged in display, paid social, that we can use them for you know, years to come versus you know, having to delete that content after days. And it's really those four pillars that we've used to develop out our influencer practice. We've applied our same performance approach and uh, lens to media that we've had for 20 years as an agency. Um, developed uh, you know, processes within partnerships and technology to identify those trends that actually maximize them, and then have created specific partnerships to help identify influencers for our clients. One is influential that will be here today. Um, if you want to know about how IBM Watson can help you identify and optimize your influencer campaigns, highly recommend you tracking her down and talking to her. It's been a great partnership and provides a lot of opportunities for our clients. As Brittany said before, like why we think the influencer marketing space is so valuable and has so much potential, potential that stat about 92% of people trusting a friend or a personal recommendation, which is, I don't know who the 8% are that don't trust friend recommendations. <laughs> Any new friends? But you know, everyone knows this, that you, you trust a, a personal referral. And as people start following these influencers, see their content and their feed every single day, it becomes more personal and becomes a lot more easy to buy in versus that of a sponsored post from a brand. But you can see this stat alone from millennials, but it just comes to user-generated content of how much more they trust that content coming from that uh, you know, kind of validated source versus that coming from you know, cold from a brand. And we're seeing this on like the front grounds or front lines right now in the paid social space as we're starting to integrate paid into our influencer strategies more and more. If there's one thing you can take from this and go to your IP account director or your social team and talk about immediate next step would be about integrating your influencer strategies into your paid strategies. Because right now we're seeing on average when we leverage influencer content as our content that we're amplifying within the social space, on average we see a 3x increase in performance versus that coming directly from the brand. So we took throughout the network of clients four examples where they're leveraging influencer content that we've been able to create testing plans of actually uh, true A-B tests of brand content versus that coming from the influencer in a paid environment um, across a variety of KPIs to highlight the impact that we've seen. The first is Pfizer and leveraging UGC content to have a 24% uh, decrease in cost per click. This is on a traffic driving campaign. Next, and one I've worked closest with, uh, is find Irv and talk more about it. If you see Irv from Colligan Water, they relaunched their uh, brand this year with a uh, 30 second spot during the Golden Globes. They had Carrie Ellis of Princess Bride revive his role of Wesley uh, for the 30th anniversary of it. We actually worked with Carrie and his team to actually whitelist him on Twitter to be able to amplify his content. And we actually promoted content directly from Colligan and directly from Carrie during the Golden Globes. And we saw a 28% increase in completion rate of those 30 second spots. And this actually drove over 500,000 completed 30 second views of a 30 second spot within a two hour, two and a half hour span, which is more than you could pretty much equate from the ratings that the Golden Globes got of what attentive uh, you know, behavior is during those you know, premium events, that they were able to maximize that strategy by executing this in social and through the influencer space. Next is Pier One and Carousel ads leveraging user generated content versus their own brand created content. Um, you know, pitted head to head against each other and the UGC content had a 52% increase in click through rate. And lastly is Hilton, um, more of a top funnel strategy and we're optimizing for reach, uh, really looking for broad scale. We used influencer content to actually drive a 57% decrease in CPM. And this is due to the algorithms of the networks and specifically Instagram in this example, to where they reward content that consumers engage with. If it's getting a lot of interaction, a lot of click through, you are rewarded in the algorithm via cheaper rates. So since this uh, influencer content got such high engagement, we saw a huge cost efficiency when uh, reaching new audiences. 
And when we're thinking about this concept of using UGC and in influencer content, we realize that not all content can come from influencers and be UGC. You heard from Steve and Karen about the importance of brand content and the role of brand content. So when we think about it from that perspective, there's a lot that we need to do to make sure that social creative is set up for success. It has to be data informed, media led, and designed specifically for the feed. If it doesn't have all three of those things, you're doing your campaign a disservice before you ever even press launch. Launch. And the reason why is because creative, when all else is created equal, is by far our most powerful optimization lever. And the algorithms and the auctions are scanning this content, evaluating it, and ranking it before a human ever sees it. They continue to work once engagements start or, or don't, um, but it's really important to make sure we use what we know about these algorithms, the auctions, <coughs> about best practices, and about historical performance to inform the data that we put into market. Otherwise, there's no way you're going to be able to meet those business objectives. So we wanted to bring that to life for you a little bit. We're going to show you um, an example of something that we consider meeting all best practices. This was for one of our clients, Hollister. You can see, and, and Katie and I talked about this a little bit this morning, but the idea of a sort of choose your own adventure approach, this ad gives someone the ability to be immersed with the brand and be familiar with the products. And then if they're ready to convert or want to learn more, we're giving them that mobilizing information that they need to click through and get that information or take that action rather than feeling like we can only show them brand content and then it's up to them to go and find the site later. So we're making it easier. It's also good because they have the, they have the ability as the consumer to watch a video, but if they don't like videos, and I actually am one of those weirdos who never wears headphones, so I typically don't watch videos on my mobile, um, I can skip that and go to the rest of the content and move around to what makes the most sense for me. It's also thumb stopping. Um, which we're going to talk about in a second. So first and foremost, we have to make sure we're using those ad units. Katie revealed um, two upcoming ones to us before. We talked about how there's over 175 different ad units available. They're designed to drive specific user behaviors. So it's imperative that we are using the ones that are designed for those purposes and testing them and determining which ones work best, depending on what your KPIs are. And that's directly tied to production. And we were just having a conversation about this a little bit earlier. But the idea that we have to arm the production teams with what they need to produce the raw content that we can then use and resize and edit to be designed specifically for the feed. If the, product, the production team doesn't know that we need vertical or doesn't know that the next A-B test that we want to try is lifestyle versus product shots, then we're not going to be able to deploy that. So there are best practices that we can arm you with, to arm your production teams with, to make sure that we're producing what's needed for this space specifically. The other thing, this is very tactical, but the objective, the bid type, and the ad unit all have to match. There are best practices, and if those aren't in line, there's a possibility that you could be um, given a disadvantage in the auction. And lastly, the idea of thumb stopping creative that I mentioned. This is something that's becoming a bit of a buzzword in the industry. And the reason why we like it so much is because it's focused very much on the consumer behavior. We're all probably guilty of it, having your phone, using your thumb, and either speeding through your feed or just passively perusing. And if you're not actually creating something that's worth stopping on, there's no way you're going to be able to drive those additional actions, which are the ones that you're really trying to get. So when we think about thumb stopping creative, you have to remember that you're not just competing with your typical competitors. You're competing with every advertiser who's going after that target audience, and you're competing for those people's attention. So if your content isn't thumb stopping, you're not going to be able to continue to drive performance forward. So if we can just align on overall themes from today, from this Insights Lab that we'd love you guys to take away. First and foremost is keeping social accountable. Every aspect of your social ecosystem should be held to the same standards you would keep any other media channel to. Social prospecting. So we talked about it this morning, and Jordan talked about it in detail, so I don't want to beat a dead horse. But we want to make sure that everyone understands just how valuable social can be in that mid-funnel. Because we're seeing so much success with many of our clients in the search space, with RLSA and customer match, and we're reaching that point of diminishing returns. Social can be used very effectively to drive and to build those audiences that can be used for true integrated and cross-channel conversion. Next, uh, influencer marketing is here to stay. It's getting more and more developed. It's having more and more opportunities for our brands and clients that we do think that it can be an incredibly successful part of your overall media mix if it's approached with a performance lens. 
Organic social is evolving. The days of spending tons of time and energy and money on these content calendars where the creative only lives in the organic space and isn't integrated with SEO and on platforms where the reach is lower is just not having the same value that it used to, but there is still value that can be derived there if everything is truly integrated across the board. And lastly, for both paid and organic social, creative is our biggest optimization lever. It's gonna be the biggest impact to the overall uh, strategy and the KPIs that we're trying to hit. We believe firmly that your social team, your media team should have a seat at the table when production is discussed and ultimately agreed upon so that we have the right assets to drive the results that you're looking for. So thank you so much for your time and attention. We have some time, I think, left for questions. We'd love to answer anything that you have for us. Um, any insights around what makes or drives uh, some of that performance in terms of boosting uh, the influencer post, given that the consumer can still see it's associated with the brand? So what is it about that creative or the messaging that maybe allows it to perform so much better? I'd say first and foremost, it looks so natural to the feed. Like the influencers are taking content that looks like your friend's content. Might be a little bit better production value and staged a little bit more, depending on who your friends are. Um, but you know, I feel like it just feels so much nat more natural. So I think that's one thing. I do think, you know, from the days of Grand Hill drinks Sprite and ET eats peanut butter cups, like there's a thing that we even know it's a paid for thing, but you associate it with someone that you trust and respect, and it has an impact of what uh, you know those type of partnerships have had for decades.